Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week, Byron brings us an African medley. He's shooting Hyrax, Baboon and Bushbuck. Plus Gary Green goes back to school and takes his DSC-1 with Yellen Deer Services. Byron has returned to his roots for an extended hunting trip with friend and guide, Lano Renz. Bushbuck is top of the quarry list, but the team have a few days to make the most of being out and about in the varied landscapes South Africa has to offer, and there may well be opportunities for various other quarry. Byron and Lano head out onto some promising looking ground. This should be an ideal place to begin the hunt. Lano's son has accompanied them and secures the vehicle before the trio set off on a footstalk. They haven't got far before they spot signs of the local wildlife. A leopard print indicates a big cat is active in the area and there are indications of bush pig not far away. However, they have yet to see any signs of bush buck, so they continue onwards. We spot bushbuck tracks in the soft ground by a stream, but our attention is drawn to something else. A hyrax, also known as a Darcy, the Swahili name is Pimby, and it is an ideal chance for Lano's young son to hone his hunting skills. A fine shot puts Pimby in the bag, and later that day Byron gets an opportune chance at a baboon. It was a quickly taken shot and we couldn't capture it on camera, but Lano explains why taking the baboon is so important. Look, baboon is a very destructive type of animal. They're very naughty, especially in the Eastern Cape where there's a lot of dairy farmers. They will plant crops and the baboons will go into the fields and they will actually take the seed from the ground. So the crops will never come to their full potential. Also, the baboons will go into the farmer's stores, open bags of feet and... Uh, you know, they won't just eat, they will destroy as far as they go. There's many stories going around of farmers where the baboons come in and they will actually chase the cows away and eat and the cows can only come in after they have eaten. Also where there's sheep farmers, uh, sometimes you get solitaire baboons that got kicked out of that, which is normally old males, and they become very aggressive, um, attacking the sheep, eating the lamb, um, eating especially the, after the, the lamb's milk bladder. Uh, so yeah, the farmers abso absolutely hate them in South Africa. Um, they're very destructive and uh, they just do a lot of damage. Um, most people at home especially will be used to shooting deer or antelope um, proportioned animals. Baboon obviously is a primate, so where are you taking a shot when you're trying to shoot a, shoot a baboon? Uh, well, normally the best, the best place to aim is for the chest, uh, where all the vital areas is. If you can come close enough, a headshot will do. But there's too, room, too much room for error, uh, so obviously the chest area is a big area and wherever you hit it in the chest it will go down. Two species down, but you haven't yet got what we came for. 
Byron and Lano start again the following afternoon, still searching for the elusive bush book. Heading to the edge of the farm, there doesn't seem to be a suitable beast in the area, so they make the decision to start climbing, and see if the height advantage will help them spot a bush book. The area is thick with dense scrub and the stalk lasts for hours. Although Byron and Lano spot a few females, the males remain absent and they press on, undaunted. Coming out of the thick scrub provides a clearer view, and we quickly spot a female browsing along the edge of the tree line. The setting sun means time is short, and this is the best lead we've had all day, so we decide to sit and wait, hoping a suitable ram will follow the female. Thankfully, it isn't long before everything comes together. The bush buck's position means Byron isn't done with crawling yet, as he makes his approach into a shootable position through the screw line. The fading light threatens to defeat us, but switching to infrared mode on the camera, there is still just enough light left for a shot. Byron stays low and crawls in closer. <laughs> the book's adrenaline fueled death dash has taken him into the trees, but the shot looks spot on, and the hunters soon find their elusive quarry. Look, a bushbuck is uh, exactly what the name says. It's an animal that lives in the bush. They will come out in the first hour of daylight, uh, where they come out to feed. And also the last hour of daylight, especially your old big rams, will come out just before dark. And also when it's nice weather outside, they will normally feed through the night. The farmers many years ago, as with a lot of other antelope species in Africa, uh, they thought that the bushbuck was uh, part of a problem for them eating their crops that they've planted for their cattle and uh, for their sheep and for uh, um, vegetables and such. And so they've shot out a lot of them. But through the years, uh, through hunters and conservation, a lot of the numbers has grown again. And uh, actually it's uh, against the law to shoot a female uh, bushbuck in the Eastern Cape. You can go to jail for that. So yeah, the bushbuck is uh, not an easy hunt. Um, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance, especially if you're looking for a specific ram. And it might take days. And uh, they might just come out uh, after dark and then obviously you don't want to take a shot. Uh, bushbuck is also called uh, the devil of the forest in Africa uh, through the sharp tips of its horns. Um, it's not an easy animal. It can charge you very easily. Uh, especially where there's uh, hounds in the area. Um, there's many stories going around with hounds uh, chased after a bushbuck on spur and the bushbuck actually turns around and uh, just come with their head down with the horns and uh, in some cases the hunter end up with a couple of puncture wounds and uh, so yeah it's definitely an animal to reckon with and not to be taken easy.
Well, the last day um, we went back to the farm where we've been hunted, hunting the first two days. And we were crawling, literally crawling through the bushes, getting some thorns and sticks into our arms and ears, crawling through spider webs and through the, the river valleys. And we came across some good rams, but you know, they see you long before they, you see them, especially in the thicket and you have to be very quick. Um, you basically see the, the horns in the body with a second and it doesn't even give you enough, enough time to lift the rifle into your shoulder. So we've seen two rams but we couldn't get a shot and uh, we've been hunting there till what, about 11 o'clock. Then we moved to another farm that I'm familiar with and uh, as we arrived onto that farm immediately we saw two nice rams far in the distance and, uh, but unfortunately after some investigation that was on the neighbor's land and we weren't allowed to hunt there, so that was out of the question. And then we uh, well, got some height and we scanned the area and eventually we started walking down this, this hill. And uh, at first we couldn't get anything there, we saw a couple of females and then again got back to the vehicle, scanned the area and then Byron spotted a bush pick running in broad daylight. Um, but on our way there, we saw some female grazing along in, a, in an open field and we decided to leave the bush pick and go for the bush buck, look if there's rams. And we walked to the open field, uh, crawled up to the bush, bush buck and we got within about 80 meters from them and they didn't know we were there. And waiting, waiting, patience and the ram came out like within the last 15 minutes of daylight and Byron hit it with a perfect shot, jumped off, ran about 20 meters and with the last breath jumping through the bushes and that's where we found it. Especially in this area most of the farms around here is dairy farms or stock farms. It's, it's normal seven wire or five wire cattle fences that's up and uh, this area I mean bush park is free roaming, they're all over and even with a, a game fence, a game fence doesn't keep a bush park in. They will go through the tiniest, most uh, unthinkable places, especially because they're living in the bush and they're used to crawling through funny places. Byron once again getting all the best jobs there. And now, the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. The Home Office has started a joint operation with the shooting community, including Basque, to assess the correct proportion payable by shooters for licensing services provided by the police under the Firearms Act. The operation's remit will include costing each step of the licensing process and decide whether they should be attributed to shooters or taken from the public purse. Civil servants confirmed at the first meeting that there would be no changes in licensing fees in the short term. The group is expected to meet throughout the year. Basque's Director of Firearms, Bill Harriman, said that Basque welcomed the Home Office's approach and that it should produce a fair and just outcome on fees. The Countryside Alliance has labelled Labour's desire for shotgun certificate holders to prove their suitability to own a firearm an unwarranted attack on shooters. The CA's Director of Campaigns, Tim Bonner, said that in the context of the current Home Office and ACPO review on police guidance for the fitness to possess firearms, the new proposals from the Shadow Crime and Security Minister Diana Johnson were completely unjustified and will be seen as an attack on the legitimate shooting community. Gamekeepers have warned that the Kappa Cayley could be facing extinction in Scotland for the second time if more coordinated efforts are not made to protect it. Predation from Pine Martin is a particular issue for Kappa Cayley, and members of the Biodiversity Action Plan have recommended a trial removal of Pine Martin from core Kappa Cayley areas, though no research licence has yet been granted. Read the full story in the next issue of Modern Gamekeeping. A new initiative to provide a coordinated response to poaching has been launched by the England and Wales Poaching Priority Delivery Group. Project Trespass will aim to tackle poaching by offering advice to those affected, providing intelligence to the police and publicising arrests, seizures and convictions. Kevin Hunter, the head of the National Wildlife Crime Unit, said Project Trespass will help in the effort to coordinate intelligence and responses to reports of crime. And finally, the British Deer Society is urging motorists to be extra vigilant for deer this autumn. A bumper mast crop has seen deer crossing roads to reach acorn supplies, and with the rut in full swing, male deer are more likely to forget about the danger of busy roads. The BDS's chairman, Mark Nicholson, said autumn is the time of year when vehicle and deer collisions peak, so motorists need to be especially alert. The BDS has advised drivers to cut their speed in areas where woodlands adjoin the highway. 
That was the Shooting Show News. Regular foxer Gary Green has swapped the high seat for the classroom. He's studying for his DSC1 courtesy of Yellen Deer Services. Doing a DSC1 at long last. Been on the cards for a long time and finally decided to jump in with a couple of guys that just happened to say they was coming down who I knew and thought it'd be a good idea to finally get it out of the way. Because um, over the years it has cost me some stalking whereas I could have had it and was actually given it um, and then taken away again, which is fair enough, you know, because it is a responsible thing and I want to be that, I want to be responsible and have needed um, qualification. Yeah, I mean, I've been around a long time in the shooting game, but now this opens up a whole new world to me because I've been promised quite a lot of stalking. I think I've got it on the strength of all being well getting this level one as a qualification. Day one was all lecture work stuff. But it's, it's something that I've put off for a long while because of a dyslexia thing. I'm hoping that this is going to give people confidence to come forward who might suffer from the same thing. I hated school, especially the classroom. I was all right in the, uh, in the sports department and PE and stuff like that. But it was a nightmare come true again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I'm honest, keeping up was a big thing. Um, it's all gone into one a bit at the minute, but there was various aspects of hygiene, safety, identification and so on. It just went on and on and on for me. It all went into one of it. But um, in the main, um, I just feel there was loads of stuff covered. I've gleaned a lot of knowledge, which I'm pleased about. I thought I knew a bit, as I said before, but I know a lot more already. And I realise now there's a lot more to learn as well. Loads of questions fired at you at random, um, multiple answer questions. Um, mock tests, ID tests by slideshow, growlicking on video, it just goes on. Yeah, I'm pretty wrecked actually. <laughs> and the guys here are fantastic. I mean really, Malcolm, one of the guys, and Mike, Dave, they've all done their own bit in their own way and various parts of it and found it really helpful and, and genuine, you know. Um, but they're on your case, uh, nothing's easy. Well, it's pronounced, yeah, everybody calls it Jelen, but it's actually pronounced Yellen. And it basically means red deer. It's an Eastern European uh, translation for red deer. And how we came about to use it is uh, when I was f farming deer in Wales, uh, I worked for the Graham Carr International Deer Group at the time, and they were the first company that uh, imported red deer from the Yellen Reserve, which was Marshal Tito's private hunting reserve in what is now Croatia. And uh, it's some of the best red deer in the world that I've seen. So, uh, you know, we kept the name Yellen uh, as it is synonymous with quality and uh, I think that's what we provide as a company. Yellen Deer Services basically provide a, an entire range of, of services across the whole spectrum of wild park and farm deer management and that includes import, export, deer fencing, live capture, building up handling systems, you know, park culling and marketing of uh, venison and services as well. I mean, Yellen has been running uh, DSC-1 courses since uh, the very early stages of, of DSC-1 in this country. And, uh, you know, prior to that, we were running our own in-house training courses uh, anyway. And that all started because we wanted to try and get uh, people who could provide the services that we need to give to our, our clients. The, the schedule courses and uh, all of those can be found on our website, but we also do bespoke courses as well. And uh, you know, this is this is one such course that we ran uh, today for Gary and uh, and these two pals. And uh, you know, so we can we can provide a training course tailored for the for the particular client, depending on what they want. There's basically uh, three of us in the, in the main sort of instructional team. as myself, as uh, Malcolm Brown and David Watson who, who conducts most of the range work. Uh, but there's also other, other guys that come in and help from time to time. We're not looking for to fail people uh, at all. And I mean, if, we, if people fail on our training course, we consider it that we have failed. We make it as painless as possible. But, uh, you know, and, and we run it as a relatively short course as well. I mean, there's a lot of DS 
SC1 courses been run throughout the country, uh, many of them three, four, five days sometimes, and I think four days about the, the norm, three to four days. Um, we'd run ours in, in two and a half days typically, and uh, you know we, we get quite a bit of criticism saying that you know the short courses can't be as good as the long courses. Uh, they are, they're just as good, in some cases better, and uh, what makes them better is that we give people a lot of pre-course uh, study material to do at home in their own time and uh, you know Malcolm keeps in touch with them over the the two three weeks prior, prior to their course to make sure that they're they're getting the work done and they understand that if they don't do the work then they're going to have trouble come the assessment day so uh, you know the pre-course learning material is pretty important the, the basic structure of the course didn't vary much at all from, from every other course that we've run. You know, if, if people have learning difficulties, then we do make a special effort to ensure that they're not disadvantaged and that we give them every opportunity to be able to, to take part in the, in the assessments. Uh, in this case, uh, Malcolm Brown, who's uh, one of our instructional team, actually asked the questions and the questions are written down, or the answers are written down exactly as, as Gary sort of uh, answers them. So it takes that pressure off of people with problems such as dyslexia. I think it's important that sort of people with with learning difficulties or, or even physical disabilities don't feel isolated uh, or, or feel that they're not going to be able to take part in these uh, these courses and these assessments because at the end of the day they can you know I think Gary's sort of happy with the way it went uh, time will tell obviously when the when the results come yeah, the assessor, uh, Peter Perslov, came, uh, he's, he's basically a BASC uh, assessor and uh, he comes down to assess our courses and uh, you know, we, we've now uh, got BASC accreditation, so we've BASC accredited trainers. So that, that helps and uh, you know, we get a lot of support from BASC and uh, you know, it, uh, it means that we can provide a good service to the learners and, and ensure that they get the very best experience. Back in the classroom, Gary undertakes the first stage of testing, the written and visual assessment. He has to answer 50 questions on deer behaviour and shooting practice and identify the species and sex of 20 deer images. I'm very grateful to Malcolm that he sat with me and read, drove him crazy I'm sure over the last few days, read everything more than once to me, so I'm very grateful to him for that, appreciate that. Well, it's what it is when you reverse things up, and you can read it and you think you've sort of read it like a proofread almost, but you haven't read it correctly, so therefore you could answer it quite easily wrong. We won't learn the final results for a few weeks, but with the Gellin team proving excellent teachers, Gary seems to have done more than enough to pass. Next, the guys head out to the range for a test of safety awareness and shooting capability on deer targets. Or three qualifying shots, which is that in there. Once you've done that and you're satisfied that you can shoot in there, he'll ask you to take two shots at throwing into this kill zone here. You see it? Majesty, Rosine of three rounds load. Ready? Three rounds at your zero target. Go on. The first stage, prone shooting at 100 yards, is quickly completed. Now we move to 70 yards for the sitting shots. Gary must get two into the kill zone to pass. As an experienced rifleman, Gary has no problem with this test, but the final stage is something less familiar. Standing shots of sticks at 40 yards. A little bit nervy. I've never ever shot off sticks as such before because all my shooting is done from high seats. Um, so obviously it's a bit luxurious, but shooting off the old sticks is like shooting off top of the chivers jelly for me. Gary settles his nerves and puts the first shot in the right place and then the second. I thought it was just there. 
But we got there, it was all right. I got through the first time, qualified, and then passed the test, so I was quite pleased with that. Gary has now passed three of the five elements to the DSC-1. So far, both pupil and teacher are acquitting themselves well. Yeah. Don't normally shoot off six sticks ever, so it's an interesting one. Bit of a wobble on here and there, but we got there. <laughs> Shooting over, there's one more challenge to endure on the range, a safety test. Simulated safety assessment. Yeah. It'll be basically along the lines of a stalk. Okay. okay which I will act as your guide. Right. Whilst we're walking around, I'll give you some questions. Yeah. Um, you will also be asked to show me the correct way to get over some obstacles. Okay. Um, I've been done plenty of that, so I felt very comfortable with that. Um, but that's all about sort of basically feeling the weight of the responsibility when you're let loose into the countryside on foot. In my neck of the woods, foot stalking's pretty taboo. There's not an awful lot of ground where you can do a lot of safe backstop shooting. So that's why I always go for high seats and um, it takes a lot of that away. You, you can be you know, making life a lot more safer for yourself and everything around. Yeah, that was uh, another interesting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Stress up on. again. But no, I mean, it's... Um, it's good. It's you know I've been doing a fair bit, but these guys have really um, helped me in a way that it's they've been very patient, and I appreciate that to all of them. Um, and the, the way stuff's laid out here is really good as well for the safe backstops and double bank deer down there, and the building behind the deer that corner. There's only one safe shot out there, and you've got to find it. But no, I mean um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm wrecked. I'm knackered, but <laughs> I'm hoping it's all gone well. That's the main thing. The final element to the DSC one is an assessment on game meat hygiene. With that completed, Gary just has to wait for his results to come through, but we're confident he'll pass with a good margin. Could be five weeks. Um, well, there you go. <laughs> a bit like waiting to go in from the dentist's <laughs> waiting room, but yeah, I think I've done reasonably well. I, you know, I feel that it's gone well, so hopefully the gut reaction's right this time. Not always. <laughs> well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.